Okay, and we're live. Uh, welcome, everybody, to a, what promises to be uh, a very exciting hour. We're here to talk about AI and the future of retail. Uh, I'm joined today by a, a fantastic guest who I'll introduce in a moment, but a, a quick introduction from me first. So uh, if you don't know me, I'm Rob. I'm the CEO of a business called Wirehive, and we are a technology consultancy that specializes in working predominantly with cloud services. Uh, we do a lot of work with Microsoft and our whole mission as a business is to help solve the technology problems that come from the digital age. We we think that all businesses are technology businesses. We think that it's uh, has become the fabric of, of really everything that's going on in the business world. And we what gets us out of bed in the morning is helping businesses kind of go on that journey to implement exciting new technologies in their business and, and kind of drive them forward and make them more profitable and more successful in the process. AI is a massive buzzword at the moment and has been for, for some time. I think that, you know, in my career, I've always been in the kind of cloud and, and what used to be called hosting game. Uh, cloud came along and became this buzzword that everybody used. And it feels like AI is now very firmly in that seat. It's this thing that has become this kind of all encompassing term that actually wraps up a whole host of amazing technology. Uh, and sometimes it's useful to do that. But in other cases, it's, it's perhaps a little bit misleading because actually, AI is this huge subset of this amazing amount of different things that, that are coming together to create innovation and ultimately competitive advantage. And so I think today we're going to talk a bit about how we see bits of that big mix of things that are called AI, changing retail for the better, uh, making businesses, frankly, more engaging with their customers, whether that's a better experience, uh, making better products, designing better stores, be that physical or digital, uh, and all the kind of good stuff that goes with that. And so, uh, yeah, without any further ado, let's get cracking. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest for today, who is uh, Louise Watkins, who joins me on screen now. Uh, Louise is the sector lead for retail, consumer goods, travel and transport at Microsoft and has been with Microsoft for about 15 years. So has really seen that business go. And I can say that she can't from a, from a business that everyone considers to be a bit boring to one that's really quite cool these days and doing some amazing stuff. It's not just Windows anymore, right? They're doing all this incredible work across all different kinds of technology. Um, Louise, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to join. And thanks for the introduction as well. <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. I, I guess just briefly before we dive into the subject matter, just tell us a little bit about your journey at Microsoft and, and what your, you know, you have a very grand title. It'd be great just for our, for our audience to get a bit of a feel for what you do day to day and, and what your patch looks like at Microsoft. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, I've been at Microsoft, I think it's actually over 15 years now. I think it's 17 years. And so, yeah, as you say, you've seen a lot of change Um you know, for the better. Um, obviously, a really exciting company when I joined, amazing company now. So I feel very privileged to work for Microsoft. But I've done a number of different roles. So everything from marketing through to working with our channels, so our partners, um, through to kind of looking after our um, health business and our central government business. Um, I also worked as chief of staff for our, our, the, our corporate vice president that looked after our EMEA business. And now I'm here looking after retail consumer goods Travel, transport, and hospitality. So <laughs> quite a long title there. Um, um, but you know what I do today to day, you know, is you know we're all very passionate in my team around you know helping our customers with you know how they can dig digitally transform, um, you know, and really kind of make their impact and disrupt um, you know their markets through utilizing technology. So you know that's what we care about. That's what we love. Um, that's kind of our and butter so that's what i do day in day in day out fantastic so um great we we did invite the right person to join us just just making sure <laughs> awesome um uh, joking apart I'm, I'm you know we've had the chance to 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 chat for a little bit on this off mic and and i'm sure we've got some um some great insights to share today so um so let's let's dive into it i think the Today, um, if you're watching live, great, welcome. If you're listening uh, back as a podcast, because we're going to make this available afterwards as well, um, great to have you with us as well. The, today, we're going to kind of break the conversation into four segments. We're going to start by talking a little bit about the kind of broad trends that we see going on in retail and, and um, where AI and technology fits into that. Then we're going to focus in on some of the findings from two really interesting reports that have been put together, one that Microsoft commissioned and one that we commissioned at Wirehive, that both offer some really 
really good insight across the sector, talking to different types of decision maker and, and, and buyer within different elements of retail. Um, and then we're going to round off by just talking a little bit about where we see everything going in the future and, and what some kind of key takeaways would be. Um, if you're on the clock today, we'll probably be finishing up about 10 to 3, so in about 50 minutes time. Um, and if you want to throw some Q&A in, I believe the, uh, I'll just ask our producer, Simon, to, to double check that for me, but I believe we can take Q&A on the YouTube live stream as well. And uh, we'll do our best to fold those in either during the, the talk or at the end. So if there's any burning question or you want to dive in a bit deeper to something, um, then please throw a question in and we'll happily take that as well. So, um, yeah, I think to to kick things off, there's um, there's just like a couple of really interesting snippets from the foreword of the Microsoft AI report. And um, this is accelerate competitive, it's called Accelerating Competitive Advantage with AI. And we'll, we'll, we'll share all these links with you after the, afterwards uh, if you haven't already had a chance to read these reports. But in the foreword by Cindy Rose, the um, CEO or MD of Microsoft UK, um, there's a couple of things that I think are really good primers. And so the first is that artificial intelligence is the engine of the fourth industrial revolution and is at the heart of digital transformation currently reshaping business. I think, you know, little surprise then uh, that the global AI market is expected to be worth somewhere between 15 and, and 18 trillion by 2030. So clearly there's a massive opportunity here. All the analysts agree uh, something's going on, right? When a new technology is creating an industry of that size, is doing something good, right? Because it just wouldn't ever scale like that if it wasn't. So then, well, why is that? I think, again, come, drilling into the forward, for any organization looking to get ahead in this AI-led future, the need to accelerate the adoption of new technology across their organization is pressing. And in the report that Microsoft did in 2018, uh, which was all about getting started, the message now is it's time to get serious, right? People are deploying this stuff now. This is not a conversation today about the future in terms of three years from now, this stuff will be possible. This is about what businesses are actually doing now and, and therefore leading in their sectors as a result. And so um, th there's a really exciting opportunity here. And that's why we brought this conversation together today was just to try and give people a bit of insight into where those areas are they can focus on, you know, we've got a really broad mix on, in our audience today. We've got people from retail. We've got people working as partners to retailers, whether that's digital agencies or, you know, other types of supplier. And hopefully you'll all get something you can take away about something you can go back to your business or to your client's business and, and, and get going with straight away. So let's start with that sort of state of the nation conversation and, um, and where things are today. And I think the... The, the big question really, I suppose, is what are the key trends and, and what are the challenges that retailers have been facing? And uh, we're going to have to frame COVID all throughout this today. I mean, it's getting a bit tiring, isn't it? But of course, we, we have, we'd be remiss of us not to mention it. But, but more generally, Louise, what, what's going on in retail as you see it over the last few years? Yeah, so I think, as you say, I mean, we have to frame it within COVID. But I guess pre-COVID, you know, I remember giving a presentation actually post um NRF, which is the National Retail Federation, uh, and we talked about unprecedented times then. Um, so it's important, I think, just to remember, and I think everybody obviously on the call will remember and listening in, um, but 2019 was actually the worst uh, year for retail. I think actually it was the first contraction in the economy from a retail perspective within 30 years, um, but it makes up such a huge part of our GDP. I mean, I think it's like 31%. So um, again, at NRF, I know Satya said, you know, retail is the demand signal of the world. And I guess, and actually we were talking about this, weren't we, actually, before when we first connected. It's about, um, I think what COVID's done is actually just kind of um, accelerated the need um, to take note of these core drivers in the market and, you know, quickly adapt and respond I think retail is probably one of the highest, highest sort of competitive markets and has huge opportunity to adapt. But, you know, we are at the mercy of our consumers. We all know as consumers, you know, we have very kind of, you know, high expectations, especially in a digitally enabled world. So, so I would say the trends um, that we have today, and, and obviously we had kind of prior to COVID, was all about kind of the importance of personalization. Yeah. So we really need to understand our customer. <laughs> And I know it always seems a bit basic, but it's so important, you know, what information, you know, you have on your customer to be able to provide a much more personalized experience and service. Um, and that's also predicting, um, you know, what your customer will will require, will need, et cetera, to again, you know, meet those demands. 
Um, secondly, and I know I talk to it a lot um, with some retailers, it's all about sort of um, the importance of uh, the colleague or the co-worker. So how are we empowering and investing in the people that understand our customers the best? Um, so how do we arm them with the right technology and information to be able to, be able to provide a great level of um, service again to consumers? That's really important. And I think through kind of the you know, the remote working, et cetera, I think we've kind of brought actually cultures and co-workers closer together, despite the fact that obviously we've seen a massive kind of drop in footfall, for example, in stores. Um, I think the third one is all about um, providing the experience. Um, so this is an experience to experience the brand and the product, um, online, in-store and mobile, um, but it's also about great customer experience that you can provide. Um, for me, you know, the robustness of the e-commerce plan is absolutely paramount still and actually we talked about the importance of online store and mobile but i think what today is snapped into focus is you know your store of the future needs to be completely digitally enabled it needs to be online and accessed yeah. in store online or in the mobile or in mobile whereas i think before we've said you've got your store and it needs to be accessed online and mobile. I think there's a reverse of that now. Um, and just the last point is just around, you know, that sustainability, I think, remains absolutely critical and core to everything we do. I mean, we're a retailer as well as a technology company. And so it's incredibly important, I think, that, you know, being that business with a purpose and really thinking about how you are living and breathing that, you know, through the culture you're building, but also the technology to provide that level of, you know, support to, to deliver on your strategy. Absolutely, yeah. I, I um I didn't ask you if I'm allowed to ask you what you think of the Microsoft retail store on Oxford Street, but maybe we'll maybe we'll finish with that. Um, um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. If you if you're watching and you've not checked it out yet, when it reopens, maybe it's reopened now. Actually, I don't know. But um, when we're back to going to stores regularly, and you you happen to be strolling through Central London, do check out Microsoft Store. It's it's, uh, it's cool. It's an interesting point as well because actually all of our store colleagues are now working with our customers remotely and digitally, and working with engineering. So. Yeah. To your point, you know, we haven't, we didn't have the stores open actually either, like a lot of retailers. But actually, we repurpose, you know, that staff to actually kind of provide a much more kind of digitally enabled uh, service to customers. But um, to your point around the store, I love the store, obviously. <laughs> but my kids love the store because of the um, the Xbox area, of course, where they can fully immerse themselves in it. But yeah, yeah. No, no surprise there. But um, um, but it's a great example of what stores of the future look like. And I think, mm. you know, for me on this trends thing, I think there was, it was really evident when you went into a store from one of the new internet A DTC brands, how different the experience was. I mean, let's take, I don't know, Allbirds is probably a really good example, right? So Allbirds is a footwear brand, very mm. popular in America and they've grown quickly internationally as a result. Some say because Obama wore them, who knows, maybe that helped. Um, if you go to an Allbirds store, it's really a, a shell. You know, it's a building. It could be a warehouse anywhere in the world. Putting one in and, and, and standing it up, you could do in a day because all they've got is a, a smattering of product on the walls, um, a load of shoes stacked in boxes pretty much in front of you. And mm -hmm. when you check out, they just get a, an iPhone out with a Stripe card reader and they're just putting you through their e-commerce infrastructure. So they yeah. haven't had to build store or retail infrastructure at all. It is, an, it is a web first product, yeah. but they've realized that for something like fashion, there is a need for that customer experience, a, a physical presence and, and kind of bridging that gap to bricks and mortar. So those trends aren't new because of COVID, right? Like those are trends and transitions that have been going on for ages. And Apple probably pioneered some of that stuff. I know they're often seen as a kind of leader in that space. Um, yeah. Where you could like web book a, you know, a, an engineer engagement and turn up and they just know where you were in the store and walk over and help. And, and so so it's great that that stuff's going on. And, and I, I guess we'll come to the COVID acceleration of it maybe a bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I've talked, I guess I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit to talk about the success stories. Like where where do you see success? Like who are the retailers you look at who you think are doing this the best at the moment today, maybe over the last year and, and, and up to where we are now? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think actually many industries are successful and actually a lot of us are retailers today. <laughs> um, but actually one of the, one of the brands that I think have got it really right actually is Starbucks. 
And I think Starbucks I've admired, um, and actually we we partnered with as well because they really, I mean, to your opening um, comments, you know, they're uh, fully a technology company, and they fully understand the importance of you know data science and engineering, etc. Um, but they really focus their efforts. Um, if you think about perhaps the utilization of data and AI on providing a much more personalized experience. Um, for their consumers through kind of providing recommendations, pairing products, et cetera. Yeah. And they use a lot of the contextual um, information, you know, within the store, what the weather's like today, for example, um, and also the information they've got on the store, um, sorry, on their customers. So I think, you know, I, I think the actually the, the AI that they've utilized is all based on reinforced learning. Um, okay. It's called Deep Brew. It's very cool. Actually, it's a pretty cool name as well, isn't it? <laughs> but, they, but they really utilize technology, and I think they're a real success. And if you think about, you know, the importance of their brand and convenience um, and building out loyalty and increasing kind of, you know, the footfall within their um, stores and obviously digitally, um, you know, I think they're a real success. And also, if you think about the importance of the business for the purpose, um, they've used like technology like blockchain. If you think about Bean to Cup. Uh, the traceability, you know, the origin, the origin of kind of their beans, for example. Yeah. And I'm also think, thinking about kind of utilizing data and AI to kind of augment their capability for predictive maintenance of, say, coffee machines. So, again, I think that's a really good example of kind of providing a great experience, but augmenting capability across their entire business to improve, you know, ultimately the level of service that they provide their consumer. Um I think another brand I think personally that, that got it right is, you know, I think Marks and Spencer's, you know, solely puts the focus around the consumer and the customer service. Um, you know, they've built this vision, which is around uh, the connected, um, the connected store. So they utilize kind of computer vision, IOT devices, so the internet of thing devices, et cetera, um, and utilize machine learning. And what that enables them to do is to really, think about their store being completely digitally enabled and being able to act on, you know, the insights and information they get within the store. So whether it's the kind of temperature gauge within the freezer, it's the size of the line in the queue, it's, um, you know, something that's not on the shelf, it's the arrangement and assortments of the shelves, they yeah. optimize fully and they can deploy their staff, um, you know, where's best needed. So ultimately, again, they provide the best level of customer service and obviously they get huge efficiency gains from that as well. And actually, just, just so you're aware, they also service everything through, you know, teams and actually through their devices. So again, you know, their employees are empowered to make certain decisions and deployed and, you know, can obviously provide the updates to customers, et cetera. So, so I think they're, you know, two organizations that I think have done that really well. Yeah, those, those are great examples. And I think what's interesting about both of them is that actually their, their use of data and AI and the and the, the associated technologies. And, and that's another key point is that this sort of AI monkey is the glue that binds together loads of other stuff too, like IoT devices and edge compute devices and, you know, the tablets you put in the hands of your staff and all that stuff. It's all, yeah. it's all kind of enabled and empowered by or augmented, should we say, which I know is a, is a great way of describing what AI can do. Um, with, with this kind of stack of AI technology. And so in the Starbucks context, it's kind of transparent really to the, to the customer. As far as they're concerned, they're getting a good experience, you know, for, for lots of different reasons, but they're never, it's never obvious to them that that's because Starbucks has done something clever with technology. And I think that's, yeah. that's a really important point to make is that by deploying this stuff in your organization or for, for one of your clients, it, you're not necessarily making it front and center. You might actually just be improving things that they're already doing, making them 20% more efficient or, you know, 50% faster or whatever. Um, and I think that the Marks and Spencer's example is another great one. There's a really nice video, actually, that Microsoft have made available of some of the work they've done together. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that's talked about in the video focuses on computer vision, which is, again, a small subset of AI. In, in Microsoft world, they have this thing called cognitive services, which is basically a set of pre-built machine learning models, which again is an AI thing, uh, which replicate human senses. So that's vision, speech, uh, you know, natural language processing, understand the intent of what somebody says because of how they say it rather than the explicit words they use. And so that set of tools is something we've done a lot of work with helping businesses basically make their experiences better. And so in the example that you, you mentioned, and, and if, if you go and watch the video, you'll see they've got CCTV, obviously, throughout the stores in Marks and & Spencer, and 
uh, one of the things it does is it can detect using computer vision when an aisle is is getting a bit crowded, right? Congestion in an aisle. And then mm -hmm. that data can be logged along with the clip of the video where it met those triggers and sent to their store planners so they can work out how to optimize the layout of their stores, whether that's which products go on which shelves or how the flow works or all that kind of stuff. And like that is absolute gold dust. Like without computer vision and, and machine learning doing that, you would have to pay somebody to just sit and watch all day, hoping to catch congestion, or maybe like review the CCTV footage in just like blocks endlessly trying to find those those key moments. Um, so ultimately, it's an efficiency thing, isn't it? It's something that they could just about feasibly have done, but it wouldn't have been viable really to do it at scale, and now they can. And, and there are some other great examples in there too, so do check that out if you, if you haven't seen that and you're watching today. Um, Great. So let's talk briefly then about the international side of it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's always good to see like what's going on in the wider world. And of course, we're going to go to go east, right? Like um, China are, everybody knows, are a bit ahead of us on a lot of this stuff. Their approach to deploying new technology seems to be relentless. And um, I don't know what it is about Chinese culture. I'm not that familiar with it personally, but from talking to friends that have been out there, they just seem to be more willing to embrace new things quickly. Um, and so one such example I'm going to share with everybody today, which is a video that's been doing the rounds on Twitter. So let me just pull this through for you. Um, so hopefully this is going to come up. Uh, there we go. So this, I'll just play this through. This is a video um, of a fridge delivery in China. And so this is a, a rather small lady carrying uh, 50 kilos of fridge on her back using an exoskeleton, uh, which I can't believe I'm saying that, right? Like it's an absolutely insanity that here we are sat here just casually watching this sort of cyborg woman delivering fridges. But um, anyway, you know, there's a kind of primer of the sort of stuff that's going on over there. Um, maybe we'll bring it a little bit down to earth to talk about it. Um, what do you see going on in the world, maybe in the East, maybe somewhere else that you think maybe we could learn from in the UK or just what, you know, what's going on out there that you think is worth worthy of note? Yeah, so completely agree with you about going East. I mean, I think with, I mean, China, you know, as you say, I think that they're always going to be more forward looking. Potentially, I don't like you say, I think it's the entrepreneurial spirit. I think it's how they consume media and they you know they they are as consumers and perhaps they're you know being in more of a more digitally enabled environment um but certainly i think they've really thought very clearly and you know i think it's kind of really you know created a huge amount of return in terms of how they're thinking about um i think we call it retailtainment so entertainment so streaming media and actually kind of not necessarily moving product placing but it can be that you know the contextual side of things it could be the speech to text it could be the searchable kind of content etc but effectively it's more of a show it's an entertainment it's online media that you can stream and actually it's a different way of consumers then acting um and engaging and purchasing obviously from the retailers and brands etc and i think there's a lot we can learn from that certainly in the uk because especially if you think about this recently i mean we're all being kind of we're watching a bit more tv perhaps streaming a bit more media yeah. we're doing listening to more music etc etc and i think you know i think that will continue to your point again in your opening kind of um talk chat was just um, I think we could really benefit from that. I think it's a nice way of engaging with consumers and, you know, we, we could really think about the opportunity there. Um, and also if you think about partnerships, you know, retailers with media providers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a lot we can learn there. I think obviously from a COVID perspective being hit a bit earlier on as well, I mean, I think we uh, in the UK kind of learned a lot in terms of the consumer beh behaviour, uh, perhaps, you know, the rise of the... Um, the necessity versus kind of the brand loyalty side of this suddenly convenience overtook um, brand loyalty. So they were really focusing on the customer behavior, the employee needs um, and really focusing on the supply chain and, and shift to digital. So I think there's lots that we've learned. And as a result of that, I think has also um, been put into some of our strategies around norming and forming in terms of how we're going to come through this stronger. Yeah, and, and maybe that's a good moment to just to just sort of pivot briefly then into the COVID impact bit of this. So um, I think it would be great to just talk about what's the impact really been on UK retail. I mean, I think that 
clearly the lack of footfall has been massively impactful. So I don't think we need to really even get into that. I think it's just evident to all of us that there has been less footfall and that has put pressure on retailers for all the obvious reasons that we all will know about. I think in the context of going back to to the stores being open. I mean, it's timely. We're recording this the the week stores reopened, right, on the Monday of, of this week. Um, and as many of us have seen, there was a rush, it seemed, to get back into these physical spaces. You know, there were queues outside some of these stores and and not just because they couldn't allow as many people in as as, as, as they used to be able to, as some commentators were saying. You know, the numbers were, were pretty significant. So there was mm-hmm. clearly pent-up demand for physical retail, which I thought was interesting. Um, I suppose... Let's talk about where the positives are, maybe, particularly uh, from this. You know, I think um, who who stands out to you, you know, as someone that clearly is, is very sort of connected to the sector as a whole, which retailers do you think have been shining lights here, have been, have sort of managed to to capture this almost increase in demand online, maybe, or, um, or have sort of pivoted effectively? Like, where are the examples that you would point to of what good looks like over this last few weeks and months? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think just I mean, look, actually, we, we do quite a lot of work with KPMG, and actually, just before perhaps I answer that question, it's probably sure. important important to note that um, I was really amazed by there was a the research report that was um, I think it's a couple of weeks old now, but um, something like sixteen percent of consumers said that they would go back to how they've been they they previously purchased pre COVID. Forty seven percent of them said that they would purchase how they are today. Which I think actually does, pres- and the rest of them, by the way, is a mix between the two. Um, but I think it presents a real opportunity for us, you know, as retailers, to really think about how we are taking the learnings and adapting to kind of a demand that's now being driven very much digitally. You know, regardless of whether or not it's still going to be pick up in store or you're going to, you know, visit the store, but a lot more is being done digitally simply because people have been forced into a new type of behavior and some are going to stick and, and some aren't. But I think there's lots that we can learn there. And as I said before, I think convenience has displaced loyalty. So I think the trick is going to be how are we going to kind of start to create that brand loyalty back. Now we're starting to get into, you know, we've been in the storming phase, we're now in the norming and the forming. And again, that comes back to some of the things I mentioned at the start, which is sort of personalization, the experience, empowering the employees, e-commerce, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But to your, um, to your question, I mean, I think, I mean, if we if we take the troopers out there, you know, the, the guys that have been on the front line, you know, critical national infrastructure in terms of, um, you know, supermarkets, um, you think about someone like a Tesco and how they've had to adapt. Um, I mean, I know that Gartner, I mean, I was on a, it, well, basically Gartner's sort of called them out as well, very much successful because, They've been able to deliver this kind of, you know, digital online service and be able to cater for the masses, you know, and kind of really transforming their business model. And that's not because, it, you know, it, they weren't, they were kind of archaic or anything before that. They were very forward thinking, but they were able to transform and um, adapt really quickly to consumer demand. So I think that was kind of one of the success stories, if you think about it. And also understanding the importance of some people like to click and collect, some people like still the delivery and ensuring that there was that fairness for, for all, I think. Um, I think another good you know example of that is say someone like a Sainsbury's, again, similar. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, we, we've worked with Sainsbury's around, you know, you think about the remote working um, and utilisation of kind of you know, conferencing and collaborating, what kind of stuff. I think what that did um, was actually teach a lot of the or a lot of the retailers to understanding that you can make a really significant technology change really quickly if you have to. You start with yes rather than no. And actually, yeah, yeah. about someone like Sainsbury's, I think it took them something like only three days to put their entire operation online and you know have people collaborating, whilst they then had to kind of feed the nation in terms of in this crisis. And actually, I think you know all of us probably have learned a lot from that kind of environment and how you know the art of the possible therefore with consumers and satisfying consumer demand so so i think they've been you know hugely successful if i think about non-essential retail um i guess you've got the likes of next who i think have adapted really well obviously they've had a really strong partnership model actually pre-covid um and actually can continue to do a lot of their stuff online and digitally um someone like asos they continue to do their surge sales throughout the COVID crisis, um, and they've, I guess, benefited from the elasticity of the cloud. They've still done these surge sales, 
But they've also kind of introduced now smart changing rooms online, you know, through utilising AI. They've got the kind of augmented reality catwalk. And this is all about showcasing different you know, garments on models of all deep, different kind of shapes and sizes. And that not only improves the personalization and experience, um, but it also means that they can have, they can bring that kind of in-store experience in terms of, you know, more success of finding the right garment for you and fit for you online. So I think they're a really good example of really utilizing, I guess, the power of the cloud, but also augmenting, again, capability um, through the use of artificial intelligence. And to your point four, none of it's sort of, you know, we talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, I, I kind of like to call it that augmented kind of intelligence because it's not artificial. It's just really improving the capability of the smarts that you've already got in your organization. And how do you scale your vision and your consumer experience out to consumers? And I think that, you know, ASOS are a really good example of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, the irony, of course, is that ASOS is as seen on screen, which nobody seems to know anymore, but it started off with a very different purpose, but it um, couldn't be better placed, really, could it, for, for <laughs> um, lockdown fashion selling? And yeah. but, um, I think, so two really good examples there. I mean, Tesco is a business where I think clearly they were built to scale really effectively, and um, they had their technology estate in really good order going in. Clearly, they, they had all the data in place and being captured in such a way that they could respond very, very quickly to demand. They could understand where their demand was coming from, what it looked like, um, and, and, and adapt. And as a result, they've been a net gainer. You know, they've, they've sold a lot of product through this time and have had a really great quarter. They've hired a lot of new, new staff. You know, they've been a real growth story through, through this period, which has been great to see. And as you say, you know, ASOS and others have, have perhaps, who frankly were pretty you know, pretty amazing technology-led organizations already have just, it's just given them new impetus to drive through things like the digital catwalk, which has been on their roadmap for years, but they've gone, wow, okay, now's the time. Like, we really need to push this forward because, you know, even though we didn't have physical stores, now we've got all these extra eyeballs because we get, we're winning, you know, customers from these other locations where then, which are, which are shut, right, which are no longer accessible. So, um, yeah, another another really good example there. And I think there's a lot, if if you ever want to have a look at how to use technology properly throughout an organization, I think ASOS have a, are a pretty good case study, right? Like they they've always been really solid on their on their approach to technology, and um, I know that's another big Microsoft success story as well, right? So it's convenient we're talking about it now. But even if even if I was talking to Google, I'd still be referencing ASOS. Like they are really really solid as a uk success story about using tech to, to make their business better and and i agree on augmentation you know the what's the microsoft phrasing for it it's empowering every person on the planet to do more or something like that like but it's true mm -hmm. like that that's what ai does it helps us augment our own capability these systems are nothing without the data we give them and we're going to talk a bit about bias in those data sets later but mm -hmm. that data all comes from humans or systems humans have made and so um Ultimately, all we're doing is improving the things we can do and the ways in which we can do them. And so when you frame it like that, it's much easier to get started because you can just look at things you already do in an organization and say, well, how do we make that 20% better? Maybe there's a tool that can help, right? And and and, and, off, and those examples you've, you've cited are, are brilliant in that regard. So um, just rounding off then on, on COVID, I think the um, just the acceleration of evolution, if there's anything left to say, I mean, from my perspective, I love data. Like I love looking at stats in these times of transition. The story the data tells is that we've seen three years of forecasted e-commerce growth in three months. So, yeah. the, you know, the graphs, I, I was going to put one on the screen, but I don't even need to because all you need to do is imagine a hockey stick, right? Like it's just ridiculous up and to the right. Um, I don't think that trend will be reversed anytime soon. You know, I think most of that transition is going to stick personally. Um, but I'd really like your opinion. You know, where where do you think the acceleration has taken place around that sort of evolution of the high street and, and that physical to digital world? Is there anything you'd, you'd cite specifically? Yeah, I think, you know, I think retailers are really... So, so I think, if you know, we talked about artificial intelligence and actually the reason why artificial intelligence works with these companies that we've referenced and obviously many others that are adopting it is because there is a clear strategy and, you know, it's, I think we call it the culture of participation, but it's very much a company-wide strategy. Um, but underneath it all sits the importance, to your point, of data. 
And, you know, we talk a lot about kind of disruptors in the market. A lot of them are disruptive because they can think solely of the consumer journey, differentiation in the business, you know, in the market. And then how do they kind of map their data to enable, you know, um, you know, the right product, the right place, right time, or even I think it's now, you know, I think it, I want it, it arrives, okay, kind of concept. So I think what this presents in the market today is that it's leveling the pe- playing field in that everyone is an entrepreneur. I think we talked about, um, you know, the convenience has kind of displaced loyalty, but that said, we have a real opportunity now to actually kind of now rebuild that loyalty. And I think a lot of retailers are already kind of, grasping that concept, but it does fundamentally come down to your data and, you know, mapping that back to the outcome you hope to achieve. And then, you know, augmenting the capability, you know, across that kind of consumer life cycle. Um, and a lot of people talk about kind of cutting costs and reducing operating costs, especially as we're in this type of kind of, you know, well, entering to a degree into a bit of a recession and it's a bit tough in terms of cash flow. But I think it's incredibly important, you know, to continue to invest uh, in the learnings that I think we've achieved, and I think we can start off, you know, with 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 data, basically. So probably that's how I'd summarise it. Number one thing that I talk to customers about. Yeah, and totally agree. Data is where this always seems to end up starting. But the thing we find when we do, particularly, uh, sometimes we do sort of cloud like cloud workshops or you know AI jumpstart program kind of workshops for people where we help them figure out like what even could you do with this stuff. And sometimes we do them for free up at your place in Paddington and people come to to Microsoft's office and we we run those together. And and the thing that's always surprising to me is that people don't realize how much data they've already got. Like every every business has this exhaust of data that comes out of them. And and it's about how do you make sure you capture it and then turn it into something valuable. So when people go on about like data is the new oil, you know, the, the obvious um, slightly painful extension of that metaphor is that you need to refine it. A barrel of oil is worthless if it lands on your doorstep unrefined, you know, and, and that kind of journey with data is a key part of it. But yeah. um, Absolutely. And, and just on that, I think yeah. you know, the only thing, the observation I'd make is you think about, you know, a lot of retailers are obviously global organizations now, if you think about the, you know, re- the reduction of the global barriers. But actually, I did also speak to some retailers actually kind of throughout the crisis and they didn't, always necessarily understand how they could respond to COVID also because they didn't have, I guess, the link between the data they have on their consumer, where they were purchasing the products, categories, all that kind of stuff. So if you can imagine the agility that you have in order to adapt your business and build out new business models and go to different geos and all that kind of stuff, in addition to think about like today responding to a crisis, you know, again, that for me amplified the importance of, data because actually I found that some would have to then go externally to look at the market but actually couldn't look at the data that potentially they could have had at their fingertips you know to, to be able to you know order to act on that information and insight yeah totally agree um right brilliant what a great first section let's um you know I think we've covered some of the key trends some of the opportunities who some of the winners have been if you want to know who the losers were you'll have to you'll have to speak to us after class we're not gonna we're gonna keep it positive today but i'm um i'm happy to have a have a quiet chat with you afterwards about where the losers have been although we, we won't do that on the stream um mm-hmm. there definitely have been some too though i think it's fair to say mm-hmm. um let's um let's talk a bit about your report because i think that a lot of a lot of these white papers are frankly pretty dry you know like they're not very good they're marketing um, almost advertorials um this one's really solid go and read it everybody it's really really well put together and there's a lot of great insight in there um it's called the accelerating competitive advantage with ai report it was published last year uh, and it's something we've referenced a lot in the work we do with clients because it's just really actionable stuff in there um there's a couple of really nice quotes that I'd like to lead with from the retail section, very pertinent to our discussions today. And, and this one frames the whole thing beautifully, which is retail is far from dead or dying. Instead, physical stores are transforming into customer experience centers and sales are increasingly moving to a virtual space where the industry is booming. I think that is such an important truth to understand if you're in, involved in retail in any way. Retail is not dying. Consumer spending has never been in a better place. Okay, maybe a few hiccups from COVID, but broadly over the last three years, you know, retail is in a fantastic environment, being a 
afforded all these amazing new opportunities for growth through digital and customer experience and all this stuff. What's, what's under pressure is the legacy ways of doing things. And so as we've always seen through technology innovation and AI is the latest battleground really, it, it, it creates opportunity. And for those that grasp it, they outgrow everybody. You know, another quote from the same report, organizations already scaling AI are performing 11.5% better than those who are not. 12%, great, you know, they're they are, they are outperforming by 12%, like that is significant. And, and, that's, and that's really only just getting started. And I think the, you know, what the data tells us is that businesses that are just experimenting with AI in small pockets, you know, it's a great place to start. But actually, it's time now to start thinking clearly about how this has a, fir- you know, as a first class citizen in a business and, and a key part of strategy all the way through from, bo- you know, board all the way down. Uh, and the whole business is kind of connected to that. So um, I think the, the other thing that I wanted to pull out just before we dive into the conversation is that the research you guys did showed that across all the sectors, retail actually uh, is the, at the earliest stage of its AI led digital transformation, which to me, as someone that works with retail, is exciting because what that says to me is this is the biggest opportunity, right, of all the of all the sectors that remains to 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 get the value from this stuff. Um, so that's you know that's really nice to hear, particularly for the people watching this today, because there's there's great opportunity there for us all to capitalize on. And I think you know the last the last thing to say is that um, the, the the commentary was that. While retailers do by and large acknowledge AI's potential to enhance their business performance or customer experience, they also acknowledge that they're slow to capitalize on it and and risk missing the bus altogether if they don't get on with it now. And this was last year, right? So almost a year on from that being written, uh, and it it can only be more true today. So, um, Mm -hmm. you know, let's let's dive in and, and get your thoughts. So the findings were basically that it's a huge growth opportunity, but retail's been a bit slow to get going with it. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think, um, and actually, it was a bit of a surprise. Actually, I think when when I think the the report was compiled, because you know, retail as an industry has a huge access to data and intelligence. <laughs> as I said, it's like the demand signal in the world. So why aren't they as far um, in terms of the journey? But I think there are a few things. I mean, I think um, retailers perhaps dabbled in some of the uh, kind of technology, like perhaps chatbots um, online. Um, and sometimes I think, and this might come back to perhaps also, we need to probably talk about the responsibility and the ethical side of things. But I think sometimes this is also because perhaps the, um, I think the technology was re- released kind of in a pocket um, and in a, potentially in a silo. Um, and it's not a disservice to those that have kind of implemented that type of technology. But I think it's just, you know, it comes back to your point that, um, you know, AI needs to be a strategy company wide. We need to understand what that entire consumer journey is going to be and, you know, what is that technology going to augment or fulfill? And again, that shouldn't scare people off. But I guess what I'm saying is, and actually it was really interesting because we presented on this back in October, November time, and we had a panel and I was presenting and a lot of people come up to me and um, ask me afterwards. They said, oh, you know, I don't feel I'm kind of there yet. I feel like leapfrogged. And I've got miles to go. And I said, well, no, you're at an advantage. If you know what you're trying to achieve and the outcome you're driving, and you've potentially got the entire company behind you, you can leapfrog into kind of a really fully digitally enabled digital transformation, you know, so sorry, AI kind of empowered digital transformation. So so I think um, number one, I think what actually came out of the reports was skills. And that's sort of the digital skills, but also the understanding of what artificial intelligence can do to augment the capability of your organization. And to your point, is everyone from the board kind of downwards or sideways, however you want to um, articulate it. But it's really important that everybody's on board um, because AI can so fundamentally improve and accelerate your business. It's really important to ensure that, you know, you have the right strategy. And I think another thing that came out in the report was, you know, are you, do, do you understand how you're going to measure success and impact? And not everything needs to be measured, but actually you need to think about the impact and also how you're going to measure the performance um, in terms of the success. You know, what does success look like for you in terms of implementing the strategy? Yeah. Um, and then, so I think the democratization of AI across the organization is really important because whilst we need to build the skills and we have a skills gap, I would say also there are a lot of skills that potentially companies aren't utilizing in order to implement the right strategy. So you need that business acumen, you know, you need the technology side, you, 
you don't necessarily need the data sciences tied. You know, you can you can um, partner with technology organisations and consultancies, etc. But you know, it's very much a blend of skill sets you need to deploy the right um, strategy. Um, and then I think, lastly, it's I think you'd raised the point earlier. It's sort of the the artificial side of things that people get a bit concerned about, a bit scared about, um, and you know that AI is potentially going to take over. Um, but that comes down to again, if you build out the right strategy, you understand how you're going to measure success. You also think about your developmental standards and your operating principles. Um, you're going to roll out, you know, a fantastic strategy, and you you will leapfrog other retailers because you're augmenting the human capital that you have within your organisation. And I think I don't know how to kind of articulate it, but you can see. And I hope I'm not labouring the point of it, but it is really important. Um, if you think about what AI is doing today for the greater good, for the environment, um, you know, and you think about the capability and scale and reach that AI has in order to kind of get us closer to an outcome and critical success factors. You know, think about the art of the possible then within your organization, whether it's customer service, supply chain, whether it's kind of yeah, augmenting certain capabilities that you know can free up your people to serve. So those would be my three areas. Okay, yeah, I think the democratization point is something that gets touted a lot. And I don't, I don't think it really lands with people when you say yeah. it, and, and yeah. that's what I've always found. So from, for me, I. I I just sort of elaborate on that a little bit. So mm -hmm. th this idea of democratization of AI is about how do you put the tools and services in the hands of your entire business yeah. to get the value from them? And so uh, one of the areas that a lot of people are doing that with is data. You, you know, bring all their data together in a way that makes it accessible to everybody because actually you're, you know, in a large organization, the senior decision makers probably aren't the people who have the real insight into where the value could, you know, from that data it could be best found. And so using the sort of products and services and, and, and leaning on great technology partnerships to, to kind of make all that stuff available to everybody is really important. But the other side of it, which is less obvious, is it's just about insight. Like, yeah. again, talking about these workshops, but when we run these Art of the Possible workshops for people, we really encourage them to send people from every level of their business because it's just as important that the person working in the mailroom understands what AI can do for a business as, as a CEO. Mm -hmm. And actually often, ironically, you'll find more value from, from the people on the, on the ground, right, as it were. So, um, you know, democratization of data is a really important part of this and, and not just a kind of marketing buzzword. Like I think it's something people, yeah. people perhaps miss how important that is and, and what they can get from it. Um, I, I guess... We've talked a bit about skills. Clearly, mm -hmm. skills is a barrier, and I think right now it's an emerging and very hot sector. It's a bit of an arms race. I, I always encourage partnership. I just think, look, you right. know, you can lean on great partners to help you get started and then backfill mm -hmm. your own practice as you need to. Um, there are yeah. plenty of organizations out there like ours who are more than happy to get involved, right, um, as external consultants. And mm -hmm. I just think I've always, I've always seen this in my career. Whenever there's an emerging and hot technology, trying to build your own capability is a bit of a fool's errand. You're much better off partnering initially, and then if you, if it becomes a legacy, then then it's time to kind of insource. Um, other than skills, are there any other big barriers that you you saw from the from the report or more generally? I know it talks about them a bit in the report, but like, do you have any other sort of retail specific advice around barriers? Um. I think, I mean, I think the democratization thing is really important. And you're absolutely right to call out the, the terminology. I remember when I first read it, actually, in the report, I thought, I wonder whether it was the right word. Um, no, I think, and I don't know whether this actually comes to your report. Um, I, I think there's also a misnomer that potentially it's only used in perhaps CRM and also some of the sales tools and some of the chatbots. Yeah. And I yeah. guess it's more, that's, so that's more about, Thinking about, you know, where you would want to improve the scale, the reach, the insights, to your point, and the intelligence and analytics in specific areas that are going to really, you know, through the power of technology and through the power of augmenting, you know, you know like the artificial intelligence, you know, where would be best placed? And so I, I suppose some of it's also down to perhaps people have always pigeonholed it in perhaps a chat bot. That was something that certainly came out when I was discussing it back in the kind of October, November timeframe to, you know, thinking about 
I don't know, like a Carlsberg, for example, that's utilising, you know, artificial intelligence to think about the complex mix of flavours, for example, within the yeah, beer. Yeah. Right? So the manufacturing process, um, all the way through to kind of, you know, the NHS u- utilising it in terms of, you know, specific, um, you know, research into disease and actually supporting the National Health Service and patients and reducing costs. I don't know. So, so there's kind of like the manufacturing side, there's the supply chain side, um there's the customer service side so i think perhaps also perhaps the usage of artificial intelligence to augment key parts of not just the consumer journey but the entire kind of connected commerce platform that you have as retailers i think is probably also where we haven't seen as big a success whereas you take manufacturing organizations for example or professional services and they've already started to implement it as part of that supply chain but perhaps as retailers we wouldn't have thought that I see. So I guess the barrier then is is one of thinking and really one of understanding. And so the message to retail retailers is don't box AI off as something that is associated in t- purely with CRM or, cust- or customer experience through, you know, chatbot conversational interface. Think about it in the scope of everything you do, all the way from the way you make your product, the way you, you know, deal with logistics, every, frankly, finance, everything, right? It has, it has applications across the whole mix. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah absolutely. I mean, there was a company called Art Z. it was all part of um, some of the London School of Fashion Research that we did and they utilised machine learning for example to reduce the waste that was generated um, in pattern cutting for garments and actually so you think about the responsibility of AI there and AI for good and how they could start to then package up you know garments that are actually sold for zero waste yeah. right that helps with your responsibility business for the purpose it also supports you know your reduction in terms of operational costs and it's great you know it's great for the environment yeah <laughs> so, that re- really is win-win isn't it and uh, there's been a few particularly in the textiles uh, yeah. context there's been a few really good examples of the manufacturing efficiencies um we've got about 10 minutes left i'd just like to so we'll just we'll move on a little bit i think um the two things I really want to make sure we cover in the last 10 minutes are a little bit about our, the findings in our report and then the, the bias mm-hmm. question is really important, right, about the ethics. So just we'll just segue through our report. So we also commissioned a, a report which because we were really mm-hmm. interested in, in some of the insights around retail particularly and where the barriers were. And the thing that I just wanted to call out was that we saw the thing that stood out to me and, and definitely comes out in the data is the, res- the people who responded were incredibly varied in terms of who the decision makers were ultimately and who the leaders were around AI in a business. So, um, you know, in a travel and tourism respondent, it was a CIO. In a fashion and sportswear company, it was a founding director. In a um, in a home and a home and fashion company, it was a CMO. You know, so there's like this really interesting mix of of of, of owners of the conversation around AI within businesses. And one of the respondents said that really the only reason that their business had adopted AI was because they were a champion for it and that they were fighting a kind of uphill battle internally. And so um, I guess the the key learning really, and do do check out the report, we're going to, we haven't made it available until today. We're going to circulate it off the back of today's event um, and do have a read through, is that actually helping figure out who that champion is and then helping them build that business case back into their own business it's kind of where it's at with retail still because they're so early on in the journey and 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 actually there isn't this sort of broad understanding like you, you know like you said maybe in other industries like professional services there is of all the different things it can do and where it can have the most value so um I, I, i'll skip asking you a question about that because i think it's kind of self you know self-serving in, in terms of the, the insight but the thing i'd like to move on to is is bias and um mm. and ethics because it's so important and it comes up a lot so um, the primer for this really is that, as I mentioned before, machine learning and, and AI, you know, machine learning is one of the broadest parts of what people consider to be AI. And, and basically that is, 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 is all about using data to derive insight. But the data comes from humans, ultimately, and data sets, whether we like it or not, have bias in them. I mean, given what's going on in the world right now, this is even more topical. Um, what guidance or comments would you offer for people who are concerned about that kind of ethics question and bias in their data sets? Like what steps do you think they can take to make sure they have a culture that, that gets that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I actually think this kind of amplifies just the first point you made around your research, which is, I mean, I think it's good, like say you have change agents within the organization that can promote AI and be that person to sponsor 
But I think ultimately, this does need to be a company-wide strategy. Number one, that's really important because ultimately, you've got to think about this culture participation in order to kind of start you off on the right strategy and how you're going to measure and, you know, outcome. Okay. And it's really important to get the diversity of thought across the organization to your point as well mm-hmm. in terms of skill sets. I think that the the other kind of two key fundamental things is you need to have really clear developmental standards and you need to have operating principles. Um, and that's the only way you're going to be able to kind of ensure that the technology is deployed fairly, inclusively and ethically. So I would say, you know, it's it's no more complicated than that. But I think that's that those are the kind of the founding principles that you need to kind of adopt um, to create kind of, like you say, avoiding the ethical, the unethical use of AI. And, and I suppose ultimately, just to just to build on top of that, yeah. work with partners and, and vendors who have a com- an open commitment to how they build their tools. You know, Microsoft yeah. have been a leader in this space. I think um, some other vendors in the market have black box solutions and aren't very open about what their commitments are. Um, and vote, you know, vote with your wallet, right? Like I think, make sure that. In your selection criteria, when you're looking at deploying some of these technologies, you are thinking about ethics and bias, and and you're asking the difficult questions uh, through procurement as well. Um, look, we've got five minutes left. I'd love to just move to predictions a little bit. This has been great. We could do another hour, but um, I, I, I'm pleased to say it looks like we've had amazing engagement throughout and, and very few drop-offs. So clearly, what we've been saying has been resonating. But mm-hmm. if I'm sure if we carried on for an hour, that might change. So let's round up in, in five minutes. Um, yeah. Let's talk predictions. Predictions are a dangerous game. Uh, this is where, as the host, I get to do the fun bit of making you give them um, and then maybe saying, oh, yeah, I agree. Um, where do you think it's going, right? Like, what does, however you want to frame it in terms of predictions, maybe what does the high street look like in three years or what, you know, what's the journey retailers are going on or what does the industry look like when that AI adoption is 50%, not 10%? Um, give us your thoughts on the future. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think it's very difficult to predict the future right now, as you say, <laughs> the crystal ball, there's lots of learnings. But um, I actually think that consumer demand, I, I, I've seen it as well. We talked about the high level of expectations. In addition to that, there's this demand for more local, kind of seasonal, the stability in terms of behavior. And so I think we're going to see some of that creep in as well. If you think about you know, responsibility and social responsibility within the environment will be a critical success factor. Um, But I think fundamentally a more digitally enabled um, high street, um, I think is kind of what I see. And and, and I will go back to the point of when I said that the store of the future, which is obviously something right now is your digital store of the future. This has to be fully self-sufficient online that you can, you know, surface in store online and obviously mobile. And I think that's going to be absolutely critical, not only because of, you know, potentially other times where you could see yourself in a similar type of environment and marketing conditions that we are today, but ultimately, you know, we have seen the rise of the digital shopper. We do have these very high expectations of, I think I want, you know, it arrives. And so therefore, if you haven't got the digitally enabled kind of um, store, then I think you're going to really struggle. You know, when we talked about uh, losers kind of earlier, um, Robert, I think, you know, I think for me, that is the future. But to your point, you know, that doesn't mean that the bricks and mortar is going away. I think experience and personalization is very much going to kind of bring to the fore, if anything, a slight resurgent, if I look in the immediate future. But ultimately, I'd say that that digitally enabled store of the future, I think, is absolutely critical. Great. That's, um, that's a, yeah, You've made my life easy. I agree with all of that. Really? Yeah, no, I think I think that sounds. Um, <laughs> I think that I, I definitely agree with you about the story of the future being such a key part of it. And you know, I was, hark back to the Allbirds example I mentioned, where you could throw a store up in a in a pop up environment, and everything's already digitally enabled, and it just works. Like I think that's, I totally agree. Um, we've got a few questions, so let's squeeze them in. Um, mm-hmm. I'll do the rapid fire and then I'll give you the real ones. Where do I get an exoskeleton? China or a Lockheed Martin, I reckon, um, from James. Matt asks, uh, can we use AI to predict the lotto numbers for this weekend? Uh, I'm not, I'm sure Louise and I would not be, uh, as much as we enjoy doing this, maybe we'd be on yachts rather than in our our respective houses if we could do that. So no, sadly not. Um, uh, Florian asked uh, an interesting question, which is, 
Can you give advice for a startup who who's trying to build the tech, these you know answers to some of these questions that we've talked about on how to reach established retailers and pitch in their prototypes? Um, maybe this is something where the Microsoft startup program would be a good fit. Any any guidance there on on how to get access to these retailers? Yeah, absolutely. I think the startup program. Um, you know, we've obviously got a very robust partner program as well. So I think you know we're doing a lot around, like you say, establishing these partnerships. So. I think go online or, or ping me or ping Robert and uh, very happy to pick that up with you. Great. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think partnerships is everything when you're small at the beginning and you're getting going and and the the amplification you can get by aligning yourself with a, with a large tech vendor like Microsoft mm-hmm. is second to none because you can ride in on their coattails into into an established customer relationship with a big retailer. And um, the other nice thing about cloud technology is if you're building your your solutions based on things like Microsoft Azure and all the associated components, it de-risks a lot of the purchasing for for a retailer because ultimately, if your little startup goes pop, as long as the technology is still going to run, they feel relatively safe about in that scenario. So I think use cloud technology, be upfront about the fact that, that you, there is no risk associated with your the fact you're a startup, and, and make it clear why that is. Um, and definitely look at the partner program and the startup program. They're both great ways to go. Um, I'm happy. Any any final thoughts? Are you happy? <laughs> I'm I'm very happy. Good. I really enjoyed it actually. I mean, I think you know this is also cathartic because to your point, I don't think any of us knows the future. But I think we also understand we need to potentially even go back to the basics. Um, but I go back to my digitally enabled world. But I think it's really exciting. I'm really optimistic, and as a consumer, I'm really excited as well. So no, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Me, me too. And I, I agree. I think it's a great time to be a consumer. You know, mm-hmm. um, like there was this whole thing about the golden age of TV and how it's never been a better time to be watching stuff, right? Like I think that's <laughs> it's so true in so many ways. Um, ultimately, the consumers are winning from a lot of this evolution, uh, mm-hmm. and the retailers that that figure out how to how to capture those opportunities are the ones that will be the the, the big winners in the future. So. Um, Louise, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, Thanks to everybody watching or or listening back uh, at a later date as a podcast. If any of this stuff has resonated with you and you need help, get in touch with us at Wahai. We're happy to just talk to you for free about what we see working and what doesn't and what the steps are to get into somebody like Microsoft and and start using their kit and and looking at how you can build products or services with their technology. if you've enjoyed this this episode of Wire Live, we've got a, a series of these we're going to be running over the course of the rest of the year. So do check out another one in the future. Um, Louise, if we were on stage as we normally would be in a non-COVID world, you'd get a massive round of applause now because you've been fantastic. So um, yeah, thanks again. Um, let's wave. Let's do that awkward video conferencing wave to everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. See you later.